Hi, I'm Paul Toscano. I'm here with Margaret Toscano, my wife, my better half, my other whatever. And uh, we're going to talk today about, um, about the God concept in Mormonism. Uh, this is something about which we have both written and we've had many conversations about. And uh, it's my belief that uh, the God concept that is currently promulgated by the LDS Church leadership uh, here in 2014 and for probably 50 or 60 years um, is at odds with the God concept that exists in the Mormon revelations, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, that were presented by Joseph Smith. Now, I understand that there are questions about the historicity and the reliability of these texts in the sense of historical documents. Are they really the Abraham, are they really the Book of Mormon, is it really a historical document? That's not what we're talking about. We're looking at the texts themselves and trying to decide whether the God concept that's presented there is what the church teaches. And I frankly don't think it is. And I, I want to start out with a question for Margaret and whether she agrees with me on this, which is, <laughs> I, I'm treading on thin ice here, but <laughs> oh, okay. do, you, do you think that I'm correct in saying that the, the texts present a God concept, uh, a, a God and angel concept that's different from what is presented in the Mormon church today, or am I wrong about that? No, I definitely think that you're right. I think there's also another question that we have to consider, which is whether or not, if you look at all the texts of Joseph Smith, that there's just one concept of God in there. So that's another question which I think is equally important. I mean, I don't know that we need to argue about how the what we see in Joseph Smith and the very many texts that he produced are different from what we have today. I think that's definitely true, but maybe we should explain. Is there consistency among the texts that Joseph Smith produces? Which is a different question. Right, those are different questions, but both equally important for this discussion. Well, let me tell you what I think in okay. about two minutes, and then I want you to kind of... I'll uh, fill in the gaps or well, ask you the questions. Well, annotate it, because okay. I'm not sure that I've got a right idea. My, my view is uh, that Joseph Smith starts out with a concept of God that comes from his own spiritual experiences, probably the first vision, uh, or the visions he claimed to have when he was a youth, or maybe he picked it up from the general culture, I don't know. But I think that that view of God gets more complex over the 14 or 15 year period between 1829 and 1844 when he dies, between the, mm -hmm. the, the translation of the Book of Mormon in 1829, the organization of the church in 1830, the progress of the church in the 30s, and then the Nauvoo period. I think, I don't think he went from one position to an, an inconsistent position to another inconsistent position. I think he went from a concept of God as a kind of single divine being to a concept of polytheism at the end of his life. Really, I think it's an angelology is more than a polytheism uh, that, that deepened his view of God. It became more complex over this period. I don't think it, that his views early and his later views are inconsistent. I believe you, that you can read them as consistent. But I, I think that what he finally came to believe or was stating in his great discourses at the end of his life between 1839 and 1844, that that vision of God and the angels is quite different from what the leaders of the church today uh, apparently believe because, or what they preach or what they, they are uh, promulgating through the church manuals. I think that is, that I think is what I think. So maybe we should quickly state at least our perception of what we think the church, current church uh, teaches. Um, it's sometimes called a social Trinitarianism, which basically means that they believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and they believe that they're separate beings, and that the Father and the Son have bodies of flesh and bones, and then there's the Holy Ghost, which is this is more imprecise, but maybe some kind of a spirit being who is, you know, has this role of witnessing, right? So that's kind of the view that the, the church now uh, puts forth. And no but, females. Well, there is. I mean, the church has never disavowed the belief in a heavenly mother. 
I mean, even in, I think it was 93, where there was a talk by uh, President Hinckley, Gordon Hinckley, where he was saying that it was improper to pray to Heavenly Mother because this was a feminist issue that was arising, that was being discussed at the time. But he does say he has no reason, he says it in sort of a negative way, but there's no reason to, you know, it, not to believe that we have a Heavenly Mother, that he thinks that it's there, but we don't know much about her. I see. So, and in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, it states very clearly that Mormons believe in a Heavenly Mother, but that's really it. You know, what she does, does she have any role in the Godhead, is she just simply a producer of spirit children? None of those questions are answered. So I think that you can say, though, that it's a very, it's orthodox belief to say that there's a Heavenly Mother. Her role is not explored or explained. So I, I think you can add the Heavenly Mother to the mix. I see. So where were we though? If we had the so Heavenly Mother, so I was just trying to say that's I think what the the current position of the church is that the Father and the Son have physical bodies. Uh, there's the Holy Ghost, which is also who is also male, and then yes, there's sort of the shadowy figure of the Heavenly Mother. Now, is this in the text of Joseph Smith? No, I'm arguing. We were trying to say the contrast, Paul, between what we see as what is in the are in the text of Joseph Smith. Well, what Smith. do we see in the text? That's so what... that's we're back to that. Yes, where okay. are? Okay, I was trying to explain to you. You well, lost track. Oh yeah. That's... What is the current view of the church? Well, we got that. So, what okay. do you think now? The question is, what is in the text? Okay, you give me your view, and then I'll give you mine. Well, I think this text start out with with uh, a very uh, complex. Godhead statements that are in the Book of Mormon, which is the foundational text of Mormonism. And uh, that comes before any of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants. It comes before Joseph Smith's translation of the revisiting re re uh, the Bible and making changes in the biblical text. And it comes before the Book of Abraham. And it comes before his last great four or five discourses at mm -hmm. the end of his life, which were all on the Godhead. So I think that you have to start with the Book of Mormon and rather than finding in there a simple Godhead presentation, which is pretty much what you outlined as the church's current Godhead mm -hmm. presentation, uh, we find there a uh, very difficult to understand uh, presentation of Jesus. Uh, the frontispiece of the Book of Mormon, which is the front page, which is not wasn't authored by Joseph Smith. It, it was uh, authored by one of the prophets of the Book of Mormon. Uh, I think Mormon, according to the, according to the text. Right. The text presents it as uh, being an ancient uh, preface, and this frontispiece states that the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to prove to Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting Himself to all nations. That's the point of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a you know 550 page book, and that's its point. And, uh, but when you get into it, you've got a number of different treatises that deal with Christ, and they mostly present Christ as the supreme being, who is the Father because of the power of God, and the Son because he takes, he's incarnated in flesh, but he's the same person. So already you have dispensed with the idea of a heavenly Father. Jesus, according to the Book of Mormon, is the heavenly Father who presents himself to us as a son. We can't get to him because we can't build a tower that gets to heaven. That was tried and failed. Nimrod tried that in the Old Testament. But he comes to us because we can't go to him. And so, therefore, the Father and the Son are really the same identity. And, but then there are passages. That I think those are the majority of passages. But then there are a significant minority of passages that have Jesus praying to a being who appears to be separate from him, whom he refers to as the Father. So all of a sudden we have a contradiction right in the Book of Mormon. Right, and I, and I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm convinced as I read the Book of Mormon that the major position of the Book of Mormon is that Jesus, who is this historical person who appeared both in the Old World and in the New, uh, is both the Father and the Son, and that he is in fact the creator of the world and the personage who is Jehovah, Yahweh in the Old Testament. Right. And then as you say, the problem in the Book of Mormon, that, that's, that I think we could show from the text that that is the majority position. But then you have, especially in 3 Nephi, 
the place where when Jesus appears to the Nephites that he prays to the Father. So how do you explain that if you're going to argue that you know Jesus is the Father and the Son, he's the eternal God, which is what is stated in the preface, right? Mm -hmm. He's the eternal God, he is the one eternal God. How do you then explain the the other passages? Is there more than the third Nephite? Well, well uh, something I forget. Yeah, there's a few, but mostly right. it's in third Nephi. And also in third Nephi, curiously, when Jesus appears to the people in America there, in, in, in the pre-Columbian America, they, he appears as a resurrected being to them. They pray to him and he doesn't prevent them. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't ask them to pray to the Father. He prays to the Father, but they pray to him, mm -hmm. which is odd. And then you've got, following the Book of Mormon's publication um, and the organization of the church in 1830, then you've got all of the revelations that come uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, and they may not come in exactly the order in which they're finally published, but that's not the point. The point is, whenever they talk about God, they're talking about Jesus. I mean, 99 or 95% of the references to God in the Doctrine and Covenants are to Jesus. And uh, not I've the Father, if you, you mentioned that Gordon Hinckley said that we don't know much about the Mother. Let me tell you, we don't know much about any of the divinities. Uh, <laughs> That's true. I agree. <laughs> you know, the idea that we know that we know this abundance about, about the any Father, of the deities, not the we Mother. Don't. We don't. But, right. the, but the Father doesn't appear, uh, I think, at all, or it's very minimal in the Doctrine and Covenants. Then you get the Book of Abraham, and there's a lot of questions mm -hmm. about whether these Joseph but made we're it. Just, up. But if you, you look at the, all of these as, as Revelations of Joseph Smith. He's the producer of these Right, texts, let's just treat right? it that way. Right. What are Joseph's concepts as they come through the book of Abraham? Well, it's not the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It's a council of divinities called the Elohim or the Elohim. You can use either the singular or plural, but it's referring to uh, a council of gods. Then, in addition to that, you have apparently from July 2nd of 1839 to June 16th of 1844, four or five discourses that Joseph Smith gives in which I think he's trying to explain to the members of the church in Nauvoo uh, at that time uh, a consistent picture of what the Godhead is because he makes a real effort to talk about uh, the Godhead in these four or five discourses. I say four or five because my memory is not great, but there's one that he gives in March of 1844 which may not really address the Godhead question directly. But there are at least four that do. The King Follett Discourse, the June 16th Discourse, the Discourse on Elijah, Elias, and Messiah, and the Adam-God Discourse that was given by Joseph Smith on July 2nd, 1839. And I think those four discourses were Joseph Smith's attempt to harmonize his view of the Godhead as it was laid out in the earlier text of Mormonism. So can you tell me briefly what that is? But I don't want us to forget that I think we have to also come back to two other things. Um, the first vision accounts, and also, of course, the place of the feminine, the God the Mother. But, Absolutely. Uh, but first, I, I want you to explain, you explain to me as briefly as you can, what you think is the significance of those four discourses, and then I'm going to respond to it, and then I want us to go to those other two issues. All right. I think the four discourses that he gives basically reveal, pull back a curtain on his thinking on God. Okay. I think that Joseph Smith came to the position, came to realize. <laughs> as a good hero should. As a good hero should at the end. That he came to realize that uh, God may have begun as a single divine supreme being, but then breaks God like the Ein Sof in the Kabbalah. Right, this is a mystical, Bre mystical text. Breaks himself into what we would consider male and female principles of some fashion, and that they are able to create the pleroma of angels, which is a Gnostic idea of pleroma that they, they break themselves into these, the noble and great ones and the others, and an infinite number uh, of beings, not on his level, not, on, not supreme, but certainly capable of being enlarged to become like God. And that, that uh, Jehovah, which is Yahava, which is the male, Chava is like Eve or the female, 
that in, 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 in Jehovah really is a uh, manifestation of the male and female supreme beings, and that Michael, which means like unto God, is our representative of all the angels, which also have a male and female component that splits, and that this rolls out into the creation of dualities. Dualities which have the power to create a third thing, which itself then splits into a duality which would create a third thing, and this leads to this discussion we will someday have about a compound in one. But things, thing, you have to have the male and female principles to create. Now that is not supposed to be a, uh, a revelation about social order on earth or to privilege heterosexual marriage over homosexuality or homosexual marriage. It's not about that. It's about the idea, it's a, it's a mystical concept that God splits himself to create reality. It is a kind of, <laughs> I think of it as a kind of uh, religious version of the Big Bang Theory where you, you, you explode the time-space continuum because of the creative power. So I want to be able to, you know, we're not going to be able to have your whole explanation. No, no, no. I've got to inter interpose here a couple of things. So first of all, two things. There's the issue of primal intelligence and the notion that all of us have a primal intelligence and that none of us is a creative being, which comes out with the King Follett. Yes, none of us is a creative being. There's that being. idea. And then I would like to interpose an idea here because although we'll come back to it, it's important. I think that you have in Mormon texts an idea that can also say that same sex or likeness has a productivity to it, just as male and female has a productivity to it. So you have the Mormon texts that talk about, you know, the duality or the compound in one where you have opposites, but there's also the Mormon text that talks about that like cleaves unto like. Right. That sameness cleaves unto sameness. Right. And I think there's the potential within Mormon theology to talk about an eternal, um, an eternal productivity or um, goodness that comes out of two things that are alike cleaving together. And maybe that's a compound in one too, that we have opposites attract and likes attract. Exactly. And that they're both a part of reality that's an important thing, not only here, but in the hereafter. Because I think one of the notions that's very important, or the question that's very important here, is the issue of how do our concepts of God um, what are the implications of our concepts of God for how we organize ourselves here? And, I mean, this is an old notion that somehow we use, if, if again you're thinking of it as human justification, we can use God concepts to reinforce power structures. But also there's the issue of how can God's concepts split open the current power structures to let us think about new ways of organizing and thinking about how we interrelate to each other. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I think that what's happening, I mean, if I could look at Joseph Smith's leadership, it, it mirrors the, the his views of God, because he starts as a sole prophet, then he and Oliver Cowdery are joint, you know, senior elders of the church, and then you have a trinity in the first presidency. The first, first presidency with two counselors reflects a kind of trinitarian. Male nature, trinity. Male trinity. And then you have, at the end of his life, the, the quorum of the anointed, men and women, who for 18 months ran the church and were considered the highest quorum of the church at the time. It was considered by some a prayer circle, but prayer was, was the way you got the information from God that you could then turn into policy and church practice. So at the end of his life, he's running the church through a quorum of anointed men and women. So, so the council of God. A council of God. That's a, right. That it basically mirrors this idea of a council of God. So even the leadership that Joseph Smith created, leadership uh, institutions in the church, mirror his views about God from a, a single divinity to duality to a trinity to finally a council of gods at the end. Now, Protestants hate this because they believe in one God and except it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but fine, it's different manifestations or hypostases of a single divinity. Well, the reason I believe that's true is because Protestantism was developed in Europe during the time when kings were leaders, and Christ is analogized to a king, 
And Christ is king and Christ is Lord, and even the use of the word Lord in the translation of the New Testament is, is a reflection of the, of the way people felt power should be organized on, on a kingly monarchical basis. And so Christ becomes king. In, in Mormonism, it's developed in the United States. We don't like kings. We don't want kings. So what happens here is that the family unit becomes the metaphor for the, for the Godhead. And we have a father, and we have a firstborn son who helps him, and we have a Holy Ghost, which is kind of vague. And, and, and so that becomes the model in Mormonism for the Godhead. But I believe there's deficiencies both in the metaphor of king and the metaphor of, uh, of the family because the kingship thing has a tendency to fortify tyranny and the, and the family fortifies patriarchy. But of course, I mean, if you're going to talk about the king metaphor, though, that goes way back into early Christianity and to, you know, Byzantine power. That's true. And I would also add that historically, there's always a tension because there's a way in which, you know, Christianity uh, challenges the imperial power of Rome and then it reestablishes the imperial power through the papacy. And the Protestants that you're talking about who do like to talk about Jesus as Lord and King, but also they're part of a reformation that was very anti-monarchical. And so you always have these tensions. these tensions that people are trying to work out because indeed, as I go back to say, our God, God concepts do uh, interrelate with how we see the family, how we see government, how we see these things. And it's very hard to work out. Let's face it, it's very hard to work out. It's not as though this is an easy question. And even with Joseph Smith, I mean, there's that statement and suddenly I'll forget which section, but I think it's in maybe even 130 or 130, that 131 or something, where it says, whether there be one God or many, it shall be manifest. It shall be revealed at the end. It, revealed at the end. Right. It's not as though these things are easy, but I think that that, that that scripture in and of itself shows the tension, because I think there's a way in which the Joseph Smith concepts, God is one, but God is many too. That's right. And, and I think that that's a problem that, that Joseph Smith's theology is trying to deal with. How do we deal with the unity of God, the duality of God, the Trinitarian, the, the four, the five? And of course, if you look at mystical systems, they often talk about numbers as each having a, an important meaning for describing how the universe works. Right. And the Godhead is in a sense like that as well. Right. And so, one of the ideas that I've developed is, that goes along kind of a, a, an addendum to what you were saying, is that as I look at Mormon theology, I think it's possible to think about God in terms of, you know, you think of the, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which Mormons have been very keen to say these are three separate personages, and yet there's also a way in which maybe the old Christian ideas have some truth to them. Yeah. And so I've thought about in terms of that you think about, we start out with this oneness of God, which is broken into male and female, and that in a sense, both the male and female manifestations of God, each of them, their mother and father, son and daughter, and both of them are Holy Spirit, because really the scriptures, if you look at 88 of Doctrine and Covenants or 93, you have... You're talking about the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Yes, the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, that you have this notion that the Spirit of God emanates from the, the person of God to fill the universe, and that this is what is described as the Holy Spirit, which I would see as emanating from both the Father and the Mother. Right. But so here we're back to the complexity again. Right. God is one, God is separate, God is many, God is embodied, God is Spirit, I, I have to say that my reading of the text, I tend to think that, that God is so complicated that you need all of these pictures to explain the full complexity of what God is. Now there's a, a, a and I agree. If there is a God. <laughs> I know. There, there, there's that question That's too, always right? that question. There's always that question. We're talking about the, 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 how the texts reveal Godhead in Mormonism that's different from the manuals contemporary. of contemporary view. So, it, and laid over this, overlaid on this, is the idea that uh, there's an angelology. Right. And an angelology in Mormonism is very, uh, it's ignored. 
I mean, when, and, the, and this gets back to your question about the first vision. We have, I think, mm -hmm. seven versions of the first vision, of which four, uh, I think, were published. Anyway, the first one, in the first version of the, fir of the first vision, <laughs> you have Joseph Smith really praying for forgiveness, and he basically says Jesus appeared to him and forgave him. Mm -hmm. In the second version, there's somebody who introduces Jesus. In the third version, there's somebody who introduces Jesus and says, uh, I can't remember the versions exactly, but when you get to the fourth one, we get the picture that somebody appears and says to, to Joseph, uh, pointing to Jesus, this is my beloved son. It doesn't say it's the father. Could have been the mother. Could have been Adam or Eve, all of whom could point to Jesus and say, he's my beloved son. Right? I mean, we don't know who this person is. It's never identified. But we assume it's God the Father, although... And that definitely is... A, is I, you could have the icons of that later yeah. in the visual depictions of the first vision. Yeah. I'm where the, you have the two personages that look alike and they're appearing to Joseph. So church, that becomes the picture. Right. right? It's in church art, if you want to call it art, because there's a question yes, as to whether okay. it rises to that level. But in church depictions, you get... the father and the son. Sometimes they're identical looking, sometimes the father looks older. It's hard to say. Right. But, but these depictions really in, are attempts to, to focus the interpretation on one interpretation, mm -hmm. when really I think, the, if you read the whole text, what we're talking about is this. I believe, of course, that I have discovered the truth. <laughs> okay. It's silly, because I haven't <laughs> discovered the truth. But I've discovered an interpretation that makes some sense out of all these disparate statements of Joseph Smith. I think that what, what he's telling us is that God makes himself lower than the angels through the incarnation and never reassumes the monarchy. He becomes first in time among equals. He makes us equal to him. Because that's what, beloved, we do not know what he's going to be like when he comes, says John, I think in the, in the first epistle of John. But when he comes, we shall see that we are like him. Well, I don't see how we could become, through Christianity, like God without him lowering himself to our level and raising us to his level. I mean, that's what I think Christianity is about. Well, what does this mean about the angelology? It means that, I think, within the revelations of Joseph Smith, we can see evidence that Joseph believed in angels, and he believed that angels had uh, a, some amount of autonomy. The entire Mormon church was, comes through uh, a revelation through Moroni. I mean, we know that uh, Gabriel appeared to Muhammad, the Blessed, on, the, in Ma, on Mount Moriah, uh, uh, and gave him the Quran, or revealed Islam. We know that an angel appeared to Abraham uh, on the same mountain, incidentally. <laughs> Uh, to reveal to him uh, the, the beginnings of what became the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, the Torah didn't come then, but later. And then even, even the Masons believe that the, the, the mythical character of, whether it's a Hiram Abiff, got a revelation on, again, Mount Moriah. I mean, it's all in the same place. And that's why they fight over this particular place to this day, is because it's the provenance of a number of religions. Well, Joseph Smith is, in a sense, coping in his revelations with the problem of trying to understand the one the fact that God is one in many and my answer mm -hmm. to it is that that we cannot maintain the simultaneity in our minds we, we we leap from perception to perception from monotheism to dualism to trinitarianism to henotheism to polytheism to you know angelology we can move around but how do we make sense of this and I think, frankly, the Mormon texts are not trying to answer the question so much as to present multiple perceptions and I that may interrelate and all have truth to them. Exactly. So, do you see that you're talking about Joseph Smith's angelology? Do you also see these figures as gods, as it were, that are part of the this council of gods? That's how I tend to look at it, is that if we're talking about these figures, Michael, Gabriel, and others, I mean, I don't know, I'm speculating, right? Who knows, really? Well, if you believe in monotheism, you can't call them gods, so we call them angels. Right. But if you're a polytheist, then it's fine to call them gods, but you understand that they are not the supreme being. The supreme being is the person who... But then you can't... But you just said that he 
abdicated as the supreme being in a way I think by allowing true. a sort of more uh, equal... Uh, yeah, but he was once the supreme being, or she or they were once the supreme being, but they refused. You can't continue in that role if your purpose is to exalt your creations so that they are equal with you. And of course that kind of leads us to this other Mormon idea which, in spite of the fact that it's downplayed in you know, kind of current general authority conference discourse, the notion that we can become like God, that we will ourselves become gods. And I think among Mormon intellectuals there's a tension because on the one hand the notion of progress and of, you know, going from one state to another and progressing and increasing in knowledge and light is very appealing, especially to, you know, American Mormon intellectuals. And yet there's a part of it that seems really silly yeah. and facetious that's been made fun of in, you know... The God-makers. The, well, not the God, let's not even, we don't have to go to the God-makers, <laughs> even if you think of like in um, uh, South Park or other versions of Mormonism where, yeah. you know, the notion that, you know, you're going to go from these puny little humans here and suddenly you're into this new world and you're going to be creating your own worlds and it sounds rather horrifying because you think, do I want brother so-and-so to suddenly have charge of his own world? Well, it's right? a little bit like... I mean, it, it's, it is comic. It's the material for comedy. And... But it is like a one-cell animal giving rise to all the species of the earth. I mean, kind of the evolutionary model. Right, right? and, and maybe... the question is, you can maybe turn an amoeba into a human, but how do you get the amoeba out of the human? <laughs> or how do you, you may turn a human into a god, but how do you get the sort of pettiness of humanity out of a god, right? Yeah, how do you is get the, the same question, right? right? So, so it is silly, and um, when but you it's look always, at... But it's also, there's something exciting about it, because I mean, if we do, or if we are truly eternal creatures, Creatures that live forever and ever and ever and ever, which sounds really exhausting to me. Right. You know, I mean, maybe we could be perfected into something. Do we all have to become gods or the various kinds of things that you can do? I think that Mormonism tends to almost sometimes create a caricature of its own theology rather than kind of trying to explore, you know, the nuances and so forth. You know, we be just kind of lob onto a, a caricature of our own theology, which I think has happened with this notion of all becoming gods and creating worlds. You know? Well, one of the problems is that the leadership of the Mormon Church, which I never tire of criticizing, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> because in my view they are the Sanhedrin to the teeth, and that is that they want to stop all discussion and freeze it into the church handbook of instructions or the church latest manual that they've got. And frankly, I think Joseph... Into a controllable image, right? Right. I think Joseph Smith was more of a mystic than a prophet. I agree. And I think that his mysticism only laid the foundation of our theology and that I think his last effort was to bring people into the, anoint, the, you know, the fullness of the gospel ordinances of the temple and whatever, hoping, I think, against hope, that uh, they would participate with him in fleshing out this theology, but that stopped, and we got into you know farming and going out west and colonizing the American West and trying to build the kingdom of God on earth in a kind of utopian uh, that didn't work out. No utopian uh, efforts ever work out. They create more of a hell on earth than a heaven on earth. And here we are now in the late, uh, well, in the early 21st century uh, with a. Uh, instead of having this wonderful uh, complex God theology, which is almost like a Bach, a Bach cantata or a Bach invention, we're all doing a Lawrence Welk polka, which is a kind of a simplified version. And, which and, then and does not, become silly, right? Well, it, well, it's, become... it's not, it's, it can be very useful to people who want that, but to impose it as the church doctrine and excommunicate people who are you know, pointing out and not initially with, with any hostility, but just simply pointing out, well, you know, there's more to it than that, and being silenced, because they, they are pointing out that Joseph Smith had more to say than Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the problem. The problem, again, is not theology. The problem, again, is the attempt to impose a certain agenda of theological ideas 
and and do it by force and violence. But excommunication so, is a form of violence. Right. And so let me add an example of this that I think shows that this kind of simple version of the Godhead is not working in current Mormonism. Um, so we've already said that even the mainstream church admits that there's a heavenly mother. Reluctantly. And reluctantly, and don't really want to talk about it. Let's face it, they don't want to talk about it. But they admit it. She's like that woman in the attic in that... Yeah, the mad woman in the attic, right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, of literature. Of literature. Right. <laughs> but, um, I mean, we can trace this back to Joseph Smith. There's the New Portage vision. Right. And then the two different versions of it. One where you have... The father, so Joseph Smith, and who was his companion? Well, it was it was uh, Zebedee Coltrane. Uh, Zebedee Coltrane and either uh, Oliver Cowdery or Sidney Rigdon. So at least two or three one men of were the, there. One of those. And so there are a couple accounts of this vision, and you have them see this vision of the heavens, and they see the father and the mother on their thrones, and then the son is added to this. Mm -hmm. So I mean. This just explodes everything as well. And then in another version, at later on, as the Adam God uh, concept is developed in Mormonism, it becomes Adam and Eve and Jesus. Right. And I don't know that we have time now. That might be another little video we do, Paul, of exploring that how the Adam, the Adam and Eve and all of this could fit in. But you do have this notion. I think it's a really important vision in the sense that. It's almost like you now have a father, mother, son, trinity. Right. And But the mother is on a throne. She's sitting, ruling, dare I say, with the father, right? Right. So how do we fit in the feminine? And obviously this is very important for women and how women function. You know, are they merely the companion to the husband or do they have you know, a more central role within... A vote. A vote, dare, yes. A vote. Within priesthood, within the cosmological picture. Right. So let me give you a quick example. I think one of the most damaging things right now is the temple ceremony, which maybe we could talk about later, but in the temple ceremony, you have, Jeho you have Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael, and then, of course, here's Eve down here, and there is no picture of you know, a feminine divine, and yet this is a very, this is a sacred space of Mormonism, and women are totally subordinated. And of course, the fact that women in the current ceremony are made to be priestesses to their husbands, rather than priestesses to God, further, further yeah. diminishes women. Historically, there's evidence that originally women were made priestesses to God and that that was changed to control women. But I think the picture of the Godhead in the temple is very damaging to women. Unless? Unless you see Elohim, all of these titles, Elohim, Jehovah, and Michael, as being a combination of male as code and female. Words for something else. But because it's a drama, you'd have to add female figures. Right. So now if you see how Elohim, do you do that? If you see Elohim as the council of gods, which is what it meant, and what Joseph said in his discourse. Well, and it's in the book of Abraham. Right. And if you see Jehovah as Yahava, the male and the female divinities together. As if you see Michael, that which is in the image of God, Mich meaning like... In, which means... They the are, female they are the men. In other words, if you see in the temple the presentation of a messianic mystery, rather than taking it literally on its face value as if these are personages, they are titles that when you peel back in light of Joseph Smith's last discourses, they become a revelation of the male and female principles operating independently, not necessarily as married couples, but the reflective that these males and females may line up as opposites, they may line up as likes, they may be connected male to female, they may be connected female to female, male to male, they may be connected as a group. They may be androgynous. They may be entirely androgynous. These, to impose a, uh, a pre-judgment upon the meaning of the mystery that is inherent in the temple ceremony is, I think, the principal problem with the religion that starts out with mystical revelations and then slowly over time 
hardens into kind of a literalism. A literal and institutionalized literalism. That fortifies a kind of leadership aristocracy to continue to rule over people and punish those who want to push the envelope open. But until you break those patterns which have been made concrete in the temple film, mm -hmm. until you could have another version of it, I mean, I don't think until, first of all, I think we need to make women priestesses to God. Next, I think we would have to have male and females represented in the temple, temple film as part of the divine in order to break out of the pattern which now demeans women. And quite frankly, I see no hope that the present church structure is about to do that radical thing. But I think, and maybe, and this is my conclusion, and then maybe you can have a conclusion too. To me, the sort of sadness about what I see that's happened in the Restoration is that you start out with a theology that is not always consistent, but is full of ideas that could be a mechanism for rethinking how we view God and could add life and power to people's religious experience, it then becomes kind of, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and becomes hardened in a way that I think often then becomes a stumbling block to people even wanting to entertain the possibility of believing in God or in Joseph Smith's revelations. I think in conclusion, what I would say, just uh, certainly not, uh, just to kind not of, like this is the final word. No, on no, it's just the final <laughs> word on the on the uh, on our interview. On our interview, uh, is that um, I I think of that there are four great Abrahamic religions: uh, the, the Judaism, uh, Christianity, Islam, and Mormonism. And the provenance of each of these religions is extremely difficult because in each you have the incarnation of the Word of God. In Judaism, the incarnation of the Word, if you go back to Abraham, is incarnated in Isaac, actually, if you read carefully. The, the promise of God is incarnated in Isaac, and Abraham takes Isaac to the mountain with the idea of sacrificing him because he's the year king that's gonna die for the sins of the people of his tribe. But then God steps in and says, no, I'm the one who's going to be incarnated to die for the sins of the people. I'm the year king, only I'm the eternal king. And so then you have in Christianity, the, uh, and then later in Moses, the word of God is incarnated in Torah. And you have to keep it pure, you have to keep it exact, you have to pass these things down because this is the incarnation of the word of God. And then there is in Christianity the incarnation of the word of God actually in the person of the Jewish carpenter, Jesus. And in Islam, the incarnation of the word of God is in the Quran. And in Mormonism, the incarnation of the word of God is in the Book of Mormon. And, and any time God is incarnated, any time God steps out of supernature into nature, it is an impossible story for us to believe. It was the, when, when, when St. Paul told this to the Greeks, they just laughed at it. And the resurrection is, is, is the manifestation of that. Who can believe that God stepped into, out of eternity into time, out of sovereignty into beggarship, who laid aside his glory and his power to become a powerless Jewish carpenter. And then you've got the problem of the feminine because, because if you have Christ Jesus, then you have the whole problem of Christ Sophia. I mean, because Christ does not mean the historical Jesus, uh, just the man Jesus. Christ refers to the anointed one, Messiah. Well, what does Messiah mean but the anointed? So, so Jesus, the carpenter, is anointed with the powers of heaven. And in one of the authentic epistles of Paul, Colossians, it says, St. Paul says that, you know, in him dwelt the, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. But what is the fullness of the God but the Holy Spirit? And, and that has a feminine quality to it in the Jewish religion. I mean, wisdom, Sophia, the spirit, the chokmah, the paraclete, are, uh, have female dimension to them. But what happens is that because in the providence of these religions, the, the, this incarnation 
thing happens, it's extremely difficult to theologize or to understand in any of these religions. Mormonism is no different. And I think like you, I believe I think like you in saying that although we should keep these things open, it is the tendency of institutional religions to want to simplify this, as you say, shrink it down, make it a solid, reliable, although untrue, <laughs> a rock upon which we can build the foundation of our corporate religion, raise money, have chapels, have people come, have organizational things that they can go to, smooth, homogenize, and you know, bring together, kind of make it, make it palatable, and that that actually people love that because they don't have to, you know, they don't have to think about. It's kind of hard to constantly be thinking about your religious beliefs. You want to get onto the ball game or whatever it is that <laughs> you want. To, you want to get the kids to, you know, grow and, up. And yet and, we want religion because we want it to give us comfort in those moments when life is terrifying. But the truth of it is that... The simpler really, it is. Yeah, and the simpler it is, maybe the more comforting it is. But of course, um, I love the statement of the book of Job. It's a fearful thing to come into the hands of a living God. That most of the mystics of the world, when you encounter the divine, it can be exhilarating, but it's also terrifying because it is a very complex picture because I mean, the world is not easy, which means think that if there is a divine, the divine is not easy. It's not just, you know, the, the nice Jesus who hugs kids. Right. You can't, I mean, that doesn't really explain the, the situation, deeper, the situation in, which we find ourselves. <laughs> in which we find ourselves. So, I mean, you and I love to speculate about the nature of God and, the, and Godhead, and I think Mormonism adds some really important things to the kind of larger discussion that has been going on for, you know, centuries and centuries about trying to understand what God can be. And I, I certainly do not believe that Mormonism has uh, the corner on truth. I don't believe in one true religion. I believe, I love Joseph Smith's statement that, you know, Mormonism should be about embracing truth wherever you find it and it's a process, and I think the more you encounter the complexity, the more unsettled you feel, and I think that is why people want the so, simple picture, because it, it's kind of easier, you know, it'd be nice if we could just assume that God's always gonna be on our side, and that God is just this kind of benevolent parent or whatever, but that's not the world we find ourselves in. So you know, trying to maintain any belief in God in a terrifying world, I think is, it's a difficult thing. Well, I want to end with a quip. Okay, we're both trying to end, right? Yeah. We both want to have the last word. But That's okay, you can end with a quip. I want to end with a quip. Okay. And my quip is, <laughs> it's not that I think this, this, this uh, interview or this discussion we're having is intended to try to get, convince anybody of, of any particular <laughs> belief. No. But to try maybe to get people to realize that it, it doesn't do any good to punish people for exploring their beliefs, even within an institution. I mean, if the one thing we could accomplish is to simply get the leaders of the church and those who are very devoted to them to stop punishing people simply because they openly raise questions about ecclesiastical power or theology within a structure. I think it's going to be a lot healthier institution if we accommodate those people rather than boot them out. Well, I certainly believe that. <laughs>